Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, financial aid night, um, our presentation featuring the Office of Student Financial Assistance. My name is Chris Dahlstrand. I serve as the Director for Communications and Visitor Engagement with uh, the Office of Undergraduate Admissions here at UCF. And um, it is our pleasure to welcome you to tonight's session. Um, we have uh, Dr. Karima Manzel, who serves as the Associate Director for Student Financial Assistance here to give us a, a host of information, a wealth of knowledge really uh, relating to student financial aid at the University of Central Florida. Some other topics that we'll discuss um, include uh, FAFSA, uh, scholarships, um, work study, and things like that. And then we're, of course, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, you can enter those questions in the Q&A uh, using the feature button at the bottom of your screen. We'll certainly do our best to get to all of the questions tonight. Um, however, we anticipate a pretty, uh, pretty busy discussion as this topic oftentimes raises a lot of questions. And, and so that's one of the reasons that we're offering this session this evening to you. Um, we also have a representative, two representatives, in fact, from the Office of Student Financial Aid who are going to be assisting with questions in the chat, um, as well as myself and a colleague of mine um, who are here from undergraduate admissions to answer some other questions. So we do kindly ask that you keep your topics related to financial aid. Um, if there are some admissions questions, we'll certainly be happy to answer those. But anything else um, kind of is a little off, uh, off uh, limits this evening um, because we, we simply don't have uh, you know, the folks who are here to represent other offices to be able to handle some of those questions. So um, feel free to email us with anything that we don't get to today or any questions that you have that we just don't have the experts here to answer. Um, and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So without further ado, Dr. Manzel, I will hand the program over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dahlstrand. Good evening, everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We have prepared a short presentation that's gonna provide you with an overview of the financial aid process here at the University of Central Florida. So what we're gonna talk about today is financial aid and the process here at UCF. The types of aid available to assist students and families with your educational expenses. A few things to remember, the disbursement process, and we'll talk a little bit about our book purchase programs. So the financial aid process. The financial aid process really begins with the completion of the free application for federal student aid, also known as the FAFSA. The FAFSA is the first step in determining the type of aid for which a student may qualify. The FAFSA is necessary for a student to receive any type of federally funded financial aid, including federally funded loans. We also use the FAFSA here at UCF, not just to determine um, federal aid, it's also used to determine some of our institutional grants, as well as certain state programs as well. So we do encourage all of our students to complete a FAFSA, even if you do not believe that you may be eligible for federally funded grants. Um, some scholarships require a FAFSA, so we just encourage you to have a FAFSA on file. The FAFSA did become available for the upcoming 22-23 aid year on October 1st. That starts with fall 2022. So starting fall 2022 is when um, we'll be using information from the FAFSA that became available on October 1st. Our school code is 003954. You want to make sure you include UCF on your FAFSA when you submit it so that we get the information that you provided on the FAFSA and we do have a priority filing date. And while students are not required to file by our priority filing date of December 1st, you are encouraged to file by a priority filing date of December 1st as it increases a student's likelihood of getting maximum consideration for financial aid. So, we use tax information when you're doing the FAFSA from what's called prior prior year or two years prior. Our students who may be joining us in the summer of 2022, you would need to do two FAFSAs. The 21-22 FAFSA that covers the summer of summer 2022, that FAFSA is available on FAFSA.gov and you do that using 2019 tax information. All of our incoming students are going to need to do the 22-23 FAFSA using 2020's tax information. The FAFSA is an annual application. You must apply every year. 
And it again, it's used to determine your eligibility. You can file the FAFSA at FAFSA.gov or you can visit studentaid.gov to learn more about the federal financial aid process as well as complete your FAFSA. The expenses to attend the university are what we call our cost of attendance. The cost of attendance is a comprehensive budget. It includes your tuition and fees, your room and board, transportation to and from campus, a, an allotment for books, and an allotment for personal expenses. For the 2021-22 year, year that we're currently in, the current cost of attendance for our students is $22,424 for students who are Florida residents. Our out-of-state students do have a higher cost of attendance due to the change in the tuition rate for out-of-state students. All other components of the cost of attendance remain the same, but for our out-of-state students, we estimate about $37,450 for the cost of attendance. Again, the cost of attendance is an estimate. Some students will spend less and some may even spend a bit more, but this is what we've allotted based on the research that we've done for students to attend the university. Typically a student's financial aid package cannot exceed the student's cost of attendance. So types of aid available. Scholarships. Scholarships are my favorite types of aid to talk about because it's free money that students earn based on either their merit or talent that the student may have. Scholarships are available in a variety of different platforms and places. Um, students get scholarships from the state, such as the Bright Future Scholarship, and we'll talk about that in a little while. There are some scholarships offered by the university, the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, such as our Pegasus High Achievement Scholarships. Some students are awarded scholarships directly from their major or college. And then we also have our Access to Opportunity A2O scholarship search tool available on our website for students to search a variety of different scholarship opportunities. Grants are also free money. They're also in the form of what we call gift aid and financial aid. This is not money that requires repayment. However, grants typically have a need-based component. Grants are gonna be typically given to a student based on the information provided on the FAFSA. When a student completes the FAFSA, we're gonna get some results and those results are gonna include what we call the EFC, the expected family contribution. The expected family contribution is the number the federal government derives from the information provided on the FAFSA. It measures the family's financial strength based on that information and it also is often the, the number utilized to determine if a student is grant eligible, specifically for the Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, and the Florida Student Assistant Grant. All of those grants look at the student's expected family contribution. And then for our institutional grants, we also look at the student's EFC. Work study is a need-based program given to students who indicated on their FAFSA that they are interested in receiving work study. Um, work study is a opportunity that students get to earn a portion of their financial aid package in the form of a biweekly paycheck. Typically, the student has a job on campus or with a community partner that allows the student to earn an hourly rate and then receive a biweekly paycheck Again, it is still a part of their financial aid package and students do have to have need to receive work study, but this is a great opportunity for students to get some career experience as well as decrease the likelihood of them maybe having to take loans or if they have to take loans, maybe taking a bit less because they're earning a portion of their financial aid package. And then loans. Loans are available to assist students and families with your educational expenses. There are need-based loans such as a subsidized loan and I'll share a little bit more about that a few slides down. And there's also non-need-based loans, such as the unsubsidized loan or the Parent PLUS loan. So I talked a bit about grants, but to go into further detail, the Pell Grant is the largest federal state aid grant program. It is probably the most common grant that you will hear people talk about. The Pell Grant does require that the FAFSA is filed. The Pell Grant does have, have an expected family contribution cutoff, um, and it can assist students depending on the expected family contribution, it can assist students uh, who are enrolled less than half time all the way up to students who are enrolled full time. Again, the Pell Grant is 
deemed, uh, students are deemed eligible for the Pell Grant based on the information that's provided on the FAFSA and based on the expected family contribution determined by the federal government and the expected family contribution cutoff determined by the uh, federal student aid for that particular year. Another grant is the Florida Student Assistance Grant. The Florida Student Assistance Grant is available to students who are Florida residents, who are undergraduate students. It is funded by the Florida Department of Education. I'd like to drive home the point of why it's important to complete the um, FAFSA by the priority filing date. So let's say we do have a Pell Grant eligible student who files the FAFSA on November 1st. They meet the priority filing date. That student, could potentially get considered for a Florida Student Assistance Grant if the student meets their eligibility for that grant, as well as potentially the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. At UCF, the FSAG grant and the SEOG grant for a full-time student for the academic year is over $3,000. So that student who files by November 1st is at least considered, not guaranteed, but considered for those funds. A student who files on December 3rd a few days after our priority filing date, may not get that consideration because these are limited resources. So I just wanted to drive home the point of why it's important to file by the priority filing date with the FAFSA and also why it's important to do that each year. I mentioned the SEOG grant. It is a very limited grant. It's only available to undergraduate students and the award amounts can vary. It is typically, typically given to our students with the most need. Um, and so that grant is a limited amount of funding. So not many students receive it in the grant scheme of the university, but it does help students who have the most need. The UCF grant is an institutional grant available to our undergraduate students. Again, driving home the point that you wanna meet our priority filing date of December 1st in order to be considered for this institutional award. So Bright Futures. Bright Futures is our state funded scholarship program. Um, students eligibility will be determined by the Florida Department of Education's Office of Student Financial Assistance, also known as OSFA. In order for UCF to receive your information as it relates to Bright Futures, when you complete your Florida financial aid application, you want to make sure that you include UCF as the institution that you're attending. Bright Futures awards are based on the cost per credit hour. Depending on the tier that the student has um, earned, that will determine the amount of the Bright Futures award. And uh, we'll get into that in another slide or so, but you'll see that students who are awarded the Academic Scholars Award, they're currently being funded at 100% of the cost per credit hour. And our students who are earning the Medallion Award, they're getting 75% of the cost per credit hour. Bright Futures allows students to receive funding for up to 120 credit hours, which is typically the number of credit hours required to receive an undergraduate degree. Currently, the award amount, as I mentioned, is 100% of the cost per credit hours for our academic scholars. Our current cost per credit hour is $212.28. The Florida Medallion Scholars Award is 75% of the cost per credit hour. 75% of our current credit hour is $159.21. So depending on the number of credits a student is receiving, the Bright Futures amount, or it's taking the Bright Futures amount will be multiplied by the number of credits a student is taking. Students must enroll in at least six credit hours in any given term um, to be considered for Bright Futures. Just wanted to point out what a student needs to do in high school to be considered for Bright Futures. Um, at the university level, we only award the medallion and the academic scholars. We do not participate in the CAPE or Gold Seal programs. So our students here at UCF, in order to receive Bright Futures, must have taken the 16 college preparatory courses required, which include four English, four math, three natural science, three social science, and two world languages in sequence of the same language. In order to be considered for the academic award, a student must earn a 3.5 GPA, and our students graduating in 2022 must have earned either a 29 on the ACT or a 1330 on the SAT and complete 100 hours of community service. Our students who are um, gonna receive the medallion award 
must have earned a weighted GPA of a 3.0 and have either a 25 on the ACT or a 1210 on the SAT and complete at least 75 hours of community service. In order to be considered for Bright Futures, our students who are graduating in the upcoming uh, year here in 2022 must complete the Florida Financial Aid application no later than August 31st of their graduating year. I would encourage all of our students to get this done prior to August 31st of your graduating year. You can do this at floridastudentfinancialaid.org and I will share that in the chat um, when I'm done presenting to ensure you have that. You're gonna log in and complete the Florida Financial Aid application. That application must be on file in order for your eligibility to be determined for Florida Bright Futures. So our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try one more time. And that's a quote from Thomas Edison. And we like to apply this quote to the scholarship search. So the scholarship search is really about tenacity. It's about not giving up. It's about continuing to search regularly and often for scholarships and applying for all the scholarships for which a student meets the criteria. So there are a variety of different places where you can find scholarship. Community and religious organizations often offer scholarships to their members. So you want to, if you're connected to a religious organization or a church um, in your area, you want to see if there are any scholarships being offered by your religious organization. There are also other community organizations that offer scholarships, such as fraternities and sororities, um, civic clubs. So really look around in your community to see if there is any specific organization supporting students with their educational expenses. Internet searches like FastWeb, Chegg.com, CapEx.com, Scholarships.com, those are all places where students can find a plethora of scholarship opportunities. And as long as a scholarship is, or a scholarship search tool is not requesting a payment, I encourage the student to try to find out what opportunities are available. Business and corporations are also available to provide scholarships, some that come to mind, Target, Coca-Cola, um, but students should really look to see, um, check corporate websites, sometimes they have information on scholarships, and also look at scholarship search tools at the university. So here we have access to opportunities, we have an online scholarship search tool. That scholarship search tool includes not just internal scholarships, it also lists a host of external scholarships. And those external scholarships are given to us by a variety of different community-based organizations and other donors who are interested in assisting students with their educational expenses. This information is updated regularly, so I encourage students to take time out of their schedule, carve time out to start looking for scholarships. And it's never too early and it's also never too late. So I tell students you wanna start looking for scholarships before you get to college and continue the scholarship search while you're in college. So when you go to our external scholarship search engine, you're gonna see a variety of different scholarships the scholarships, like I said, are constantly updated. And so if you go out this week and you don't see anything for which you meet the criteria, that's okay. Look again in a few more weeks, there might be something for which you meet the criteria. And then put your name in the hat. Here you can just see where the, how some of the scholarships are listed, the award amounts, and each scholarship for more information, the student would click that yellow hyperlink that says visit, and that will allow the student to see all of the different um, instructions related to that particular scholarship. With external scholarships, each process may be very different um, because again, these are all individual entities willing to supply students with funding for their college expenses, so they have their own processes. So let's talk a little bit about loans. I mentioned loans briefly um, earlier, but I wanted to really delve into the difference between the subsidized and the unsubsidized loan. The subsidized loan is available to students who have need based on the information provided on the FAFSA. In order to determine a student's need for financial aid purposes, we take the cost of attendance, which is the number that the university has derived, 
um, based on the educational expenses a student has when they attend the university. And we subtract the expected family contribution, the EFC, the number that the federal government comes up with when the FAFSA is completed. If that number is positive, then the student does have need and could potentially be eligible for need-based aid, such as the subsidized loan. If that number is zero or negative, the student does not have need. However, the student could still be eligible for the unsubsidized loan if they meet all the requirements to receive federally funded aid. The subsidized loan, the government pays the interest while the student is in school, and it is available only to our undergraduate students. The unsubsidized loan, the interest does begin accruing immediately. The amount that a student is qualified to receive is dependent on two factors, the student's academic classification and the student's dependency status based on the information provided on the FAFSA. The vast majority of our students coming directly from high school will be considered dependent for financial aid purposes. Thus, a student who is a dependent freshman by academic classification can borrow a total of $5,500 in a combination of subsidized and unsubsidized loans based on that student's need. The government does defer payment of both the subsidized and the unsubsidized loan for students while they are enrolled at least half time. Once a student graduates, or if a student drops below that half-time enrollment, the student's grace period begins for those loans. If we make it to six months of the student not being enrolled at least half-time, the student has then entered their repayment status. The Parent PLUS loan is available for parents as borrowers. So this allows parents to borrow on behalf of their students. The federal government um, does provide this loan. However, it is a credit-based loan and parents must meet the credit criteria of the U.S. Department of Education. Interest begins accruing on this loan once it disperses. For more information on the Parent PLUS loan or any of our loan programs, you can visit our website, but there is a specific page on the Parent PLUS loan. You would have to, again, apply for the Parent PLUS loan, meet the credit criteria of the U.S. Department of Education, and then we can award up to the student's cost of attendance. The parent is the borrower and thus responsible for repayment with the Parent PLUS loan. So a few things about timely disbursements. At UCF, we utilize a platform called the To-Do List. The To-Do List is going to be uh, available to students in the My UCF portal. This is where students can see anything that our office or even other offices on campus, anything that we're requesting for the purpose of the completion of the student's financial aid file is going to be listed here on the To-Do List. And so we encourage our students to check your To-Do List regularly. It's going to outline anything you need to complete. We encourage you to submit those documents that we're requesting as soon as possible, but definitely at least 60, day, 60 days before the start of the term. We do have a May 31st priority date for to-do list items, so we want you to get those things in as early as possible to not delay the financial aid process. Some students are going to be selected for a process called verification. Verification requires our office to request additional information and essentially cross-reference that information against the information provided on the FAFSA. Verification selection normally occurs at the federal level. So a student's FAFSA is normally selected by the U.S. Department of Education. However, once a student has been selected for verification, it is our office's responsibility to collect the necessary documents and uh, complete the verification process before aid can be dispersed and before the student's financial aid file can be finalized. And so to expedite this process and to make it more streamlined for our students and families, we do utilize a product called Dynamic Forms. Dynamic Forms allows students and parents to complete the verification worksheet and other verification forms electronically. Students must have an active night's email um, which is the email platform that we use here at the university. And when you have an active night's email, you can create a dynamic form account. Um, you log in using the same information that you log in to your My UCF account with, and then you can submit those forms to our office. Parents can also create a dynamic forms account using a unique 
email address, and then you would be able to upload any documents that you need to submit along with the verification worksheet and submit it directly to our office. Again, this allows for electronic signature. And for the vast majority of our students who are dependents, instead of having to get documents back and forth to your parents, you're able to everyone to just electronically sign it and submit it. Another way documents can be submitted to our office, and typically this is for our non-verification documents. You can use our document and file upload tool found on our website, and this allows you to scan or take a picture of whatever document you're submitting and then submit it into our office. And here you can see the process for that. Wanted to touch a bit on enrollment. Um, we wanted to share that when we create financial aid packages and financial aid packages for the upcoming academic year are typically created in early March. When we create those financial aid packages, there are some assumptions we make. And one of those assumptions is that our students will be enrolled full time. If a student is enrolled less than full time, then their financial aid package will be adjusted accordingly. There are some financial aid programs that do require full time enrollment. So in order to learn more about the, type of, the types of aid listed in your financial aid package, we encourage all of our students to, to check the program eligibility charts found on our website. At the beginning of the semester, the student has the opportunity to modify their schedule. This time frame is called drop, swap, and add. During this time when student schedules can be adjusted, we wait and after add, drop, and swap, we adjust financial aid accordingly to reflect the student's actual enrollment. Also, here at the university, we encourage all of our students to complete their academic activities in their courses as early in the semester as possible. In order to receive federally funded aid, a student must be considered academically engaged in their courses. So we really encourage our students to pay attention that first week of school because most professors create an academic engagement activity within the web courses platform. And once you complete that activity, that information is shared with the registrar's office and then shared with our office. Students who do not complete the academic activity could have a delay in their financial aid disbursement. Aid will be dispersed based on the number of courses in which the student is engaged. Um, and students who do not complete the academic activity by the end of the semester put their aid in jeopardy. We again encourage our students to complete the academic activity by the end of the ad drop period each term. And the confirmation of academic activity does occur every semester. So this is something that happens each and every term. So we begin disbursements after the ad drop and swap period. So this happens during the second week of school for students who have a completed financial aid file. No items outstanding on your to-do list, students who have signed their master promissory notes if they're loan borrowers, and who have completed entrance counseling if they're loan borrowers, students who have completed the verification process if they were selected, students who do not have anything outstanding on their to-do list pertaining to financial aid, those are the students who are going to be most likely to receive an earlier disbursement. However, I would like to note, not all awards disperse at the same time. So there are times when a student's aid might disperse in tiers. So when, uh, when aid is ready to be dispersed, that's when we apply it to the student's account. Again, we start this process during the second semester, I'm sorry, the second week of the semester each term. Um, tuition is typically due the second Friday of, of classes, we typically disperse for the first time the Thursday before the tuition um, deadline. Financial aid refunds, which is the, if the student has more financial aid um, than their debt to the university for a given semester, the excess is given to the student to use for their other educational expenses. That also begins during the second week of classes. Refunds can take up to seven business days to receive. However, we do encourage our students to enroll in direct deposit. If you enroll in direct deposit, typically students will get their financial aid refund between two and five business days. If a student does not have direct deposit, it will be mailed to the address on file on my UCF. This process is not managed by the Office of Student Financial Assistance. It is managed by our partners in student account services. Students who have financial aid, receive what we call a tuition and fee deferment. So if you have even $1 
of financial aid in a given academic term, your tuition and fees is pushed to a later date, but your the due date for your tuition is pushed to a later date. If you have enough financial aid to cover your tuition and fees and your on-campus housing, if you choose to live on campus, then the housing department can see that. And even if all of your aid hasn't dispersed, housing will work with our students to ensure that they are aware that additional funding is coming the student's way. But the deferment of tuition and fees is automatic. So during the second week of school, a student who has financial aid will see their tuition and fee deadline extended until about midway into the semester. Grants, merit-based scholarships, and bright futures are all considered for the deferment process. If a student is offered a loan, the loan must be accepted. And we only process loans when a student accepts them through their MyUCF portal. So the loan must be accepted to be considered as a part of the tuition deferment. So a few things to remember. The FAFSA becomes available on October 1st each year. Pay attention to deadlines such as the payment deadline for housing, the payment deadline for tuition, the withdrawal deadline for the given term. We encourage you to visit our website and we also encourage all of our students to apply for scholarships. On that note, I am going to share our contact information and you're more than welcome to uh, visit us in room 107 or schedule a meeting on our website. We do have virtual appointments available as well. I am going to stop my screen share and then turn over to Mr. Dahlstrand. All right, thank you so much, Karima. Um, so we have a few questions that came up in the chat that uh, we thought would be good for the entire group to hear. And I would encourage any of you who are sitting out there with lingering questions that you have to get those into us. Uh, by using that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get them answered uh, quickly. So the first question um, is, when will freshman students find out if they are offered a merit scholarship? And that's actually one that I'm gonna take since my office handles merit scholarships. Um, so allow me to explain a little bit about how that process works. Um, Students will apply, and this really just pertains to freshman students, first time in college students. So um, graduating from high school, haven't gone to a college or university after high school graduation, or if you have, you haven't taken a significant uh, number of credits. Um, so traditional freshman students, um, once you apply and the admissions committee has an opportunity to review your application, um, you will be then reviewed for a merit award uh, that is upon admission. Um, usually there's a few weeks uh, uh, delay between those two things occurring. So you may be admitted and a few weeks later, the scholarship committee will have an opportunity to review that application for an award and make a decision on that and release that award to you. Um, now, uh, for those of you who may not have started the application process yet or submitted your application, we highly encourage you to do that now because there's a, not an infinite number of awards available. The, the pot of scholarship money that we have for merit awards, um, it, it gets exhausted pretty quickly. So we want you to have the best shot at being uh, eligible for some of that money. That means that you're going to have to or want to apply as early as you can so that when the committee begins to make admission decisions, you can then be reviewed. Our typical review process for, for merit awards uh, begins in November and concludes um, at the end of January or beginning of February. That's, that's typically uh, the time frame. So you're looking at a, a very small window, about three months, um, during which time we award merit scholarships. Many times beyond that point, if you're applying later in the spring, um, some of that money, it just may not be available. And, and um, you know, that's not a situation you want to find yourself in. So that that's kind of the time frame for merit awards from the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Dr. Menzel mentioned that there are other awards that are available to you from the university through departments or colleges. 
Um, and, and those will all have different timeframes and different requirements on them. So it's really important, A, to do your research very early on, but also to pay attention to the requirements for those awards, understand what they're asking of you. Is it an essay? Is it an application? What are the timelines for that? When do you need to get that in? Um, and uh, that'll ensure that you have the best opportunity of, of shoring up some, um, some of that merit money. Um, Karima, I don't know if I mentioned everything that, that needed to be mentioned all. there. Okay, terrific. Got it all. Outstanding. So on to the next question. Uh, this one is for you. So tell us a little bit about financial aid that might be available to cover housing. And is that on-campus housing or is that housing anywhere? Great, great question. So when we look at the cost of attendance, the cost of attendance accounts housing as an educational expense. So the vast majority of financial aid is not specific to a specific component in the cost of attendance. I'm going to say that with the caveat, there are a few scholarships that are very um, specific to tuition, but most awards look at your entire cost of attendance and you're looking at the comprehensive financial aid package you have. So if a student has grants and scholarships and they've decided to take a portion of their student loans, all of that is available to assist a student with their educational expenses. And then so what essentially happens is that entire financial aid package is available for the student to use. So at UCF, if we have a student who is living on campus, the student's tuition would be the first charge on the student's account that is taken care of. So let's say you have a scholarship and that scholarship goes to your account. It goes first towards your tuition. After your tuition debt has been resolved, the next part of your student account that resources go towards would be your on-campus housing. So if your financial aid package is large enough to cover your tuition and your on-campus housing, the next charge is going to be the on-campus housing. And after on-campus housing, it would be if you chose one of our book purchase programs, such as our short-term advance or a textbook purchase program to purchase your books, then any financial aid you have would go to that. And then finally, the meal plan. So that's the order in which aid is applied to a student's account. The answer to the question is yes, there is funding available to assist with housing, but it really just depends because not all students have the same type of financial aid package. Financial aid packages vary from one student to the next. If a student lives off campus, then what would essentially happen is anything above and beyond what the student owes the university for tuition, or in some cases, maybe the student has opted into one of our textbook purchase programs. If they've utilized those two things, once those two things are taken care of, anything above and beyond would be then refunded to the student to use for any educational expense the student has. This can include rent, this can include gas for your car, this can include anything you need to be a student at the university. Outstanding, thank you. Uh, our next question is, if a student qualifies for Bright Futures, does the FAFSA affect how much tuition is covered? No, Bright Futures is not a need-based award. It is fully merit-based. It is fully based on the academic requirements that I outlined in the presentation, the 16 credits that um, the OSFA is looking at the GPA, the test scores, the community service. If a and the fact that you do have to have that Florida financial aid application on file, and I'll share that in the chat in a moment. If you qualify for Bright Futures, it has nothing to do with whether or not, you don't even really need a FAFSA on file to be considered for Bright Futures. So let me clarify that. We encourage all of our students to do the FAFSA, but the FAFSA is not required for that state scholarship. The Florida financial aid application is. It is not need-based. It has nothing to do with the type of uh, need that a student has. So that being said, um, Bright Futures is not impacted by need. However, I'm sorry, Chris? Nope, go ahead. However, we do encourage our students to do the fast. Um, Bright Futures renewal 
each and every year. You're not going to have to do a new application for Bright Futures every year. You just have to make sure you meet the criteria for renewal. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here about transfer scholarships. So um, just a few moments ago, I talked about freshman scholarships. Um, so let's talk about transfer merit awards. Um, those are again uh, awarded through the Office of Undergraduate Admissions to transfer students who are admitted to the university. However, unlike freshman awards, um, which, which by the way, do not require a separate application, your application for admission serves as your application for a merit scholarship through undergraduate admissions. Okay, so it's important to understand you don't have to fill out any other paperwork or submit a request to be considered for um, a merit scholarship as a first time in college student. Now transfer students are a bit of another animal um, and there is actually an application involved um, and there is a deadline uh, involved with that as well. That deadline is typically April 1st. Um, there are also a few caveats that you have to pay attention to and be aware of. So if you are transferring to the university, um, you may be eligible for a transfer scholarship only if you're transferring with an AA, that's an associate in arts, or an articulated AS, an associate in science degree from a Florida public community or state college. So students who are transferring from private colleges or schools outside of the state of Florida, unfortunately, are not eligible for a merit award um, from the Office of Admissions. Now, there may be other awards that you can qualify for, but from my department, from admissions, um, that there are no awards, unfortunately, unless you're transferring in from um, a Florida public community or state, or state school. Um, so the AA or the AS degree uh, is, is important. If you're not on track to get that, um, you, you'll want to, uh, to make sure that you're completing that AA or AS degree in order to be considered. Um, the uh, financial aid, I believe it's called cost and aid tab on the undergraduate admissions website, lists the exact criteria and the timelines um, that you have to adhere to to be considered for that award. The application itself uh, is very simple. It's very short. It's a one-page application, so don't be too, too concerned that it's going to take you a lot of time, but you need to be aware that it's there and make sure that you file it by the deadline. The number of awards for transfer students are fairly limited, so these are pretty competitive scholarships. Um, if memory serves, I think there are about a hundred or so that we award each each year. Um, so you do want to make sure that uh, you know if you are planning on going to uh, community college or state college prior to coming to UCF, that you you know that you do pretty well. Uh, you want to have a strong GPA and, and do well and be involved um, where you are prior to transferring. Those are some of the considerations, some of the factors that we're looking at when assessing a student's eligibility for a transfer scholarship. So again, that information is on our website. Um, it's, it's very transparent and in clear black and white there. Uh, so there, there shouldn't be um, you know, any surprises with, with regard to transfer awards, but uh, it's important to note uh, Florida Community or State College, AA or AS degree, and that April 1 deadline if you're, if you're looking for a transfer award. Um, okay, so that's that. Next question. Um, Karima, could you talk to us about deadlines for the FAFSA? What is the deadline to turn that in for the summer term? So the FAFSA um, for summer 2022 will close on, Jan on June 30th. So you want to make sure you get the FAFSA done prior to June 30th of 2022. Actually, I would not wait that long. It's the, it can be done. If you are considering, even if you're not sure, if you're considering going to school for the upcoming summer term, 
I would go ahead and just complete the FAFSA. It's available now. It's better to have it done than to try to scramble at the end there. So that would be my advice. Um, when we talk about FAFSA deadlines, I do want to mention that we do have a priority filing date of December 1st that I mentioned in the presentation. That is not a hard deadline. So if by chance you didn't do it by December 1st, do it on December 2nd get it done. So, you know, sometimes students think, oh, I missed December 1st, I can't get it done. That's not the case at all. It, it is a, it's a priority date. It is not a hard deadline. The Department of Education's hard deadline is January 30th of the following, of the summer that follows that academic year. So you have time to get the FAFSA done, but we want to make sure you meet our priority filing date. Yeah, better, better late than never, right? Correct. But, but better early than late. Correct. So, <laughs> right. Um, so uh, just as a point of clarification, Karima, students are automatically considered for, for Bright Futures. So there's no need to actually apply or fill the FAFSA out. That's, That's correct? Not quite. So not quite correct. Okay. Not quite Thanks. correct. The FAFSA is not required. The FAFSA is utilized for federal right. and institutional aid. Right, Futures requires that students complete the Florida financial aid application by August 31st of their senior year. So I just shared in the chat the Florida financial aid um, website for Florida student financial aid for the Florida Department of Education. Students want to complete that form. That form must be completed by August 31st in order to be considered for Bright Futures. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, there's a question here about requirements for Bright Futures. So um, two things I'd like to, to talk about um, real quickly, and Karima, feel free to, to chime in on this. One, uh, the university does not set requirements for Bright Futures. That is maybe the most important takeaway. Um, we have to follow what the Department of Education uh, stipulates with regard to the Bright Futures requirements and eligibility criteria. So the specific question is if a student earns an ACE diploma or uh, something along those lines, um, you know, an IB diploma, for example, does that negate the SAT score? requirement or the minimums for Florida Bright Futures? And, and to my knowledge, the answer to that is no, because the requirements are what the requirements are. However, I can see you maybe have something to add there. So correct me <laughs> if do. I'm wrong. Okay. I do. So, so and currently how the legislation reads, because I, everything in financial aid is dictated by legislation. So if something changes, it can happen. But currently how the legislation reads is if a student earns an ACE Cambridge diploma or a IB diploma, earning that diploma, not taking IB courses, but earning mm -hmm. that diploma, earning the Cambridge ACE diploma will qualify a student to receive the academic scholars. Well, uh, <laughs> I learned something new today. Now, and that what is I will, why I am not giving this presentation. <laughs> what I will share is in regard to the Cambridge ACE diploma and the IB diploma, those results come out later in the, the eligibility cycle. So for students, if that's the sole reason for which a student qualifies for Bright Futures, we often do not receive that information until later, um, as late as late August sometimes or even. September. So if the student was in summer school, it's possible that we won't get the information during the summer term because we're still waiting on the results of the IB diploma, or the ACE diploma. So just wanted to share that there might be a delay in your eligibility being determined if that is the sole reason for which you qualify. Now for some students, the IB diploma or the um, ACE diploma bumps them from the medallion to the academic. And when we get that information, we can make the appropriate adjustments. But for some students, getting the um, ACE diploma or the um, IB diploma is the sole reason that they qualify to receive Bright Futures. And so um, it does take us some time to get that information. Just wanted to share that. All right, thank you. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about out-of-state waivers and how one might go about securing something along those lines? Sure, so when it comes to out-of-state waivers, our office has a very limited amount of need-based out-of-state waivers 
that are allocated to students typically in July prior to the semester beginning. Um, there are very specific requirements that uh, we utilize to determine if a student is eligible for a need-based out-of-state waiver. And I, I just want to be very clear that they are based on the expected family contribution. Um, that determination is made annually to determine who we can award our need-based out-of-state waivers to. They are very limited, and we try to award them to the students who have the most need. In order to be considered for a need-based waiver in July, when we do that process, a student must have a completed financial aid file. So going back to some of the things I was saying in the presentation, you wanna make sure you turn in any item on your to-do list as soon as possible, because having an incomplete file would mean that you would not even be considered for an out-of-state need-based waiver. Okay, thank you. Um, so how about this? And I'm very sorry, there are lawn folks outside, even at this late hour, literally blowing on my window right here. So I apologize for the, uh, for the loud noises, if you can hear them. Um, can you talk about how, um, and, and I, and I want to use the word um, creative, uh, not illegal, but creative ways to use money um, that students may have earned. So if a student, for instance, finishes their AA degree uh, prior to coming in, they're coming in with junior standing, they've got advanced standing at the university now, and, and may be able to, to accelerate um, you know, their, their time toward graduation. Um, if they have a combination of vouchers or tuition vouchers or bright futures and things like that. Is there any way to split money and use part of that for their undergrad and then anything that's left over for grad classes? So, yes, but not a lot. It's gonna be very honest. Um, students who have bright futures eligibility, if you have an accelerated graduation from undergrad, um, it is possible to receive one term of graduate funding. And that one term of graduate funding can be utilized to assist with your first term of graduate school. It is paid though at the undergraduate rate. So let's say you're getting the medallion award, it's still gonna be based on the cost per credit hour and 75% of the cost per credit hour at the undergraduate rate. If you're getting the, um, Academic award, it would be based on the cost per credit hour for the given year and 100% um, of the cost per credit hour in that given year. So yes, there is that opportunity for your Bright Futures Awards. Other awards, no. So when we're talking about like Pell Grant, for example, a student who is Pell Grant eligible, once that student earns their first bachelor's degree, they are no longer Pell Grant eligible. Okay, thank you. Um... So we, we have students who um, may be uh, qualifying for some state funding for things like adoption. Um, so they may have some funds that are coming from the state of Florida and qualify for Bright Futures and qualify for maybe VA benefits or things like that. Is there a specific order to uh, which funds are used or debited first from that allocation? And can you explain a little bit about that, how that sure. works? So waivers such as um, the waiver that students who were adopted receive um, for tuition, waivers such as the waiver that students who aged out of the foster care system receive, um, other waivers um, that are being applied to tuition as what we refer to as third-party payments are typically handled by the Office of Student Account Services. And those awards or those uh, resources are going to be applied directly to the student's account. And those will reduce, and depending on the amount, will reduce the student's tuition liability to the university. And then if the student then has any financial aid resources, such as grants or scholarships, they will then get applied to the student's account. Now, at that juncture, the student has a lot less to pay the university because these 
waivers have been applied to the student's account accordingly. And so that's when we start talking about refunds being issued. And so, as I mentioned in the presentation, a refund is when a student has more financial resources than their debt to the university. So let's say a student is receiving a waiver, a student has um, a scholarship and a grant and that pays then anything above and beyond is refunded to the student and the student can utilize those funds towards any of their educational expenses. Again, you can pay rent, you can buy food, you can use it for books and supplies for classes. Anything you need to be a student is considered a cost of your education or a cost of attendance component. Um, and so again, we're looking at housing, food, transportation to and from school, um, any books and supplies. And then there are also miscellaneous items. And I like to refer to that as, you know, all the things that we all use, just being human, we, we do have a component in the cost of attendance for that. So everything from toiletries to, you know, clothing reasonable, <laughs> not, not to buy a whole new wardrobe, but, you know, things that you're going to need. And depending on your major, sometimes students need certain things for their major, you know. Um, so we just want to make sure we include that in the allotment. So anything it takes a student to be a student, they can use those funds for. Okay, great. Um, is there the opportunity to get money refunded to the student? So for example, if a student has a Florida prepaid and then they have Bright Futures on top of that, um, does that money all go towards school expenses? And what happens when all of those expenses are met? So what Florida prepaid and Bright Futures can work in tandem. So I'd like to explain that to students because sometimes a student thinks that if they've gotten Florida pre or if they have a Florida prepaid account and then they earn Bright Futures, they're really, they don't, they can't work together. And that's not necessarily true. While Bright Futures, the amount is based on the cost per credit hour, Bright Futures can be utilized towards other aspects of the student's educational expenses. So if a student has Florida prepaid and Florida prepaid is going towards the student's tuition, then Bright Futures can maybe go towards housing or some other expense that the student has. If the student doesn't have any other expenses, let's say we have a student who is living at home, who is um, commuting to and from campus and does not really have any additional living expenses and their only concern is tuition. On your MyUCF account, you can reduce the number of Florida prepaid hours being utilized um, and taken out of your Florida prepaid account. You can go all the way down to zero in any given semester. But again, I always tell families, this is really a family financial decision, whether you choose to do that, um, because Bright Futures and Florida Prepaid, again, can work in tandem. It can be used for other educational expenses. There are some students who like to save their Florida Prepaid for graduate school. And so if you know you're going to be attending um, graduate school and you have all of your undergraduate expenses covered, then I think that's a good opportunity to maybe save Florida Prepaid for a later time. What I would say is Florida Prepaid is not handled by the Office of Student Financial Assistance. It is handled by our office and student account services. There is nothing a student needs to do for Florida prepaid to be applied to the student's account. So if a student does not want Florida prepaid applied to their account, what they want to do is make sure that they um, utilize that feature in my UCF to reduce the number of hours Florida prepaid is paying. The other thing I would mention, since I'm talking about Florida prepaid and we've been talking about Bright Futures and this is an admissions presentation, our students who have completed their admissions application, in order for us to be able to connect your student account with your FAFSA, with your Bright Futures account, and with your Florida prepaid account, there must be a social security number on file with the university. So while the admissions application does not require you to include your social security number, your application is complete. You didn't do anything wrong. But if we don't have your social security number on file, we are in a bit of a quandary because we don't have a way of connecting your information with your, your student account. And so we won't be able to get your FAFSA information. So if you notice that you're not seeing information populate, that might be a really good thing to check. Students who are admitted can use the MyUCF account to view their demographic information. At UCF, we refer to your social security number as your national ID. 
If you look at your student demographic information in your MyUCF account and see that your national ID is all X's, that means that the university does not have a valid social security number on file. And that would be the reason why we wouldn't be connecting your FAFSA or your Bright Futures or your Florida prepaid information. And I'm off my soapbox. No, that's a good soapbox to be on because each year we have to follow up with students. And I have to admit that it's it's probably a little unnerving for students and family members to receive an email from UCF unsolicited asking for your social security number. It kind of looks like a phishing attempt to get information from you. It's not. It's our attempt to reach out and, and try and get that social on file so that you can receive your aid. So um, if that happens to you, you can always call us to verify uh, that we that we are asking for that information or that we need it. But um, there's really only one way to get it from you, and that's through uh, a website where you where you upload that information. So it might look a little sketchy on first glance, but it's legitimate. Um, so I think that we are out of financial aid related questions. Um, Hayden, if you want to uh, try and tackle the question that just came in here regarding the Spark form, um, I did want to ask Krima if you um, had any information or advice for students or family members who might want to connect with you for um, more individualized counseling or questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking here? How would they get in touch with your office? Absolutely. So we are available Monday through Friday from nine to five in Millican Hall room 107. But we also have virtual appointments, which have been working really great for our prospective students because you have the opportunity to meet with a financial aid counselor from the comfort of your own home, wherever you may reside in these United States. So I will share our financial aid website. That's where you can make an appointment with one of our counselors. They are the same financial aid counselors that you would see if you walked into our office, just facilitated in a virtual platform. So I'll share that as well. Thank you. Um, I will add that uh, this presentation is being recorded. It will be put onto our YouTube page uh, probably within the next 24 to 48 hours. So if there's information that you missed um, or that wasn't clear at first uh, glance or explanation, um, feel free to revisit that and we'll send that link out to you as uh, attendees so that you have it um, you know, at your disposal. So um, I think unless there are any last minute questions, we may be able to wrap up early here, but I do wanna thank you, Dr. Manzel, and uh, our, our folks in the chat uh, handling questions in the Q&A. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you all students and family members for joining us for this presentation. Um, we hope that it uh, shed a little bit of light on what can be, you know, sometimes a little, um, a little, uh, I don't know, What's the word I'm looking for here? Anxiety inducing uh, process. Anything really relating to, to money is, is going to be uh, maybe that way. But um, you know, understand that there are a lot of resources uh, available at the university and you've got folks in the admissions office and the Office of Student Financial Aid who are uh, happy to help you at, at every step of the way. So we appreciate you um, sticking with us and uh, your interest in UCF. And we look forward to reviewing your application here very soon. So with that, how do we end everything, Karima? Go Knights. Charge on. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Take care. Good night.